Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm really happy to welcome you to today's program and exploring the intersection of race and day school culture. Today, we will have a conversation about the work that day school communities are doing to address race and racism. We'll hear how one group of funders came together to encourage broader, more long-term solutions and find out about the extended learning that will be part of this initiative. I'm happy to now introduce Paul Bernstein, the CEO at Prisma Center for Jewish Day Schools to start us off today and he will offer words of framing and he will also introduce his fellow presenters. Thank you so much, Paul. Jamal, thank you. And it is great to see everyone on this call. Thank you very much for, for joining us and being part of the conversation today. I'm going to do a brief introduction and then we're going to have a, a number of conversations among the wonderful panel that we have uh, put together. So by way of background, educating about race has long been important to many Jewish day schools, recognizing our history, recognizing the dynamics of the diverse society that we live in. But like many events last year, particularly after the murder of George Floyd, brought new purpose to this work. A year ago, many schools heard from their alumni who really out of, out of love for their schools called on them to address many aspects of race, including curriculum, hiring practices, and how we engage both inside and beyond the Jewish community on questions of race. As the network for Jewish day schools and yeshivas, schools came to Prisma, wanting to work on these issues, looking for ideas, looking for expertise and knowledge from within and beyond the day school world, simply to do the best for their students and for their communities. And what was interesting as the conversations were developing and people were coming to Prisma is we were seeing schools right across different denominations from different geographies, both as we serve in the US and also in Canada, the conversation was very vibrant all the way across. So what has followed has been possible because of wonderful partnership between Prisma, the schools and multiple funders. And I want to emphasize that our partnership with funders is much more than about the money that they are providing. We knew as we launched this, we would be trying new educational initiatives that we would need to learn as we went along what works and what doesn't, that there would be missteps on the journey. And what has been amazing is to work with funders as learning partners who have offered us enormous generosity of spirit. And we're going to hear more about that in this conversation. We want to explore that spirit and what we have gained in this work over the last year. Before we open up just a little bit for those who are not familiar, I want to give you a little bit of, a, of an overview of the programmatic side of this, and we'll go into more depth in the discussion. Prisma began this three-year installment of our ongoing investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion with two things, with learning for our own Prisma team, coupled with a deep dive in partnership with schools into race and school culture. All of the work is truly rooted in our tradition's foundation that every human being is created in the image of God, the Tzalem Elohim. So Prisma through that is committed to supporting Jewish day school and yeshiva leaders and creating, if you like, cultures of belonging in their schools. We believe that it is incumbent on educators to consider our own complex identities and the impact that those have on our capacity to fulfill our central mission to educate others. Prisma's unique vantage point as the network for Jewish day schools allows us to bring together the wisdom and challenges of school leaders right across North America and provide them with the guidance they seek around expanding their school's culture of belonging. So in this way, school leaders each chose their starting points, whether that's reviewing their curricular resources, creating professional development opportunities assessing their recruitment and retention strategies, changing their HR policies or additional investments. It's important to understand that the work that we have undertaken recognizes that different schools are in a different place and we are meeting them where they are at. And whatever they choose, these school specific changes help the Jewish community to take responsibility for all members of our community and create those cultures of belonging. We launched this work this year with a cohort of 
39 schools. Actually, originally we assumed there probably would be about 25 who might want to participate and it went well beyond that. And, and my colleague Deborah schaefer Seaman will speak more about that in a little bit. And there's more to come and we're going to discuss what's in the future as we expand that work in the coming years, which will include hiring a diversity, equity and inclusion specialist to prisoners team. It's my pleasure to introduce a wonderful group of colleagues who are with us to talk, this, uh, to talk uh, today. We have Erica Phillips, Program Officer from Crown Family Philanthropies, Deborah schaefer Seaman, who is Director at Network Le Weaving at Prisma, and Sarah de Turk, who is a humanities teacher and instructional leader at the Milken Community School in Los Angeles. Thank you all for being part of this conversation today. The format we're going to follow is we're, instead of having a panel with all of us, we're going to do some brief one-to-one -one conversations among pairs of us, and then we will open up for conversation, and I mean conversation, I invite your ideas. I know there are a number of people on this call who have also been very engaged in this work. We'd love to hear your ideas shared for the group as well, as well as any questions that you have. If you'd like to, as you're listening to speakers, share any questions in the chat, please feel free, either do it to everyone, or if you'd rather ask a question privately, feel free to message either Tamar Friedman uh, or uh, Hannah Olson from Prisma. They'll be more than happy to, to take your questions. So before we do that, again, thank you for being here. Thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for facilitating this conversation and inviting us all to be together. So first, Erica, I'm delighted uh, for that you're able to join us and want to thank you and Crown Family Fan Philanthropies really for your commitment to Jewish education and Jewish day schools, as well as your work in this particular area. And we're going to explore now what that means for you as a funder. So maybe you could tell us by way of background how you were thinking about things, what was on your mind a year ago when our conversation began and what were you thinking about from a funder perspective? Sure, thank you, Paul. Um, so just like Paul, I'll take you back to when we started having these conversations. Uh, the idea of DEI and racial justice work at Crown had not been central to a portfolio group within the Jewish giving, but obviously the values that inspire the giving of the Crown family include these topics of conversation. So when the murder of George Floyd and the elevation around the conversation of Black Lives Matter really came to the forefront, the family looked at the Jewish team and really all of its giving areas to see how could we stand up in this moment. How could we give so that in the future we would look back and know that the Crown family took a stand and had a place within the rebuilding and the support of our grantees. So we did what all um, grant makers do. We started having conversations. We talked to our grantees, we talked to fellow funders, and we really tried to define what does it mean to give Jewishly in this space of racial justice? Do we support our current grantees? Do we support Jews of color? And we came up with a few different ways. And one of the things that we found most compelling about this Prisma project was also something Paul talked about, was the idea that we could learn together, that we could collaborate across funders with a grantee, and that we could follow the process from pilot design to finish and hopefully beyond to see what impact it could make. So we came forward with Jim Joseph and Littman Camper, and I'm really happy to see that there are um, representatives on this uh, Zoom from there um, to see what we could do to support Prisma in their pilot. So maybe I will pause there and Paul can talk about how that first pilot, came, that first proposal came to be, and then the conversation that really elevated uh, to go to our, our ultimate proposal that we funded. So as we were thinking through, thank you, Erica, as we were thinking through last summer, preparing for a new school year, and uh, there was this thing called COVID perhaps that was dominating our thinking, but it was important for the schools who were saying to us, please help us and think through how we approach questions of race. As I remember, we were just grappling with what we might start with and came to you with an idea that we might bring together 25 schools for, I think, what was a five-part series. How did you respond to that? Yes, yeah, so I, rem I remember seeing that proposal. I think it was a one year plan. Um, and we really looked at you and said like, then what? It was really our goal that whatever we funded in this space didn't only leverage the moment and the conversation growth, but made sure that it stuck. Like, wouldn't it be 
wouldn't it be a missed opportunity if a few years from now, we looked back at all of these amazing DEI projects, programs, pilots, and saw that they were replaced by sort of the next topic in the news, the next current event. So how could we make a program that really had the time to integrate within the schools, to reiterate, to change, to pivot, to learn from itself, and set up a plan for sustainability so that it wasn't just a here and now, but really for the future. So we came back to Prisma, we talked to Paul and Hannah, and the other funders joined me as well, and we said, well, what about multi-year? What about a phase two? What about a phase three? Like no rush, come back to us when you're ready. And that is what ultimately um, got funded. And so um, Paul, I don't know how much back end conversation that had. It was never the funder's intention to add work to, to make you do a bigger program than you had originally entailed. But it seemed, it seemed from my perspective that our pushback was met with um, excitement and open arms. And then we therefore knew that you were really willing to do that, that longer term future vision as a partner, not only because the funders had pushed you to think in that way. Well, that was what, why I talk about really what partnership meant in that context, which was this did not come across to us as a funder telling us what to do. This was us entering into a space where, um, we were discovering within our own network what the schools really wanted sort of almost day by day and talking to a lot of them we were discovering what might be possible we were grappling with the fact that any beginning of any new school year is an immense challenge and involves an incredible amount of work and this year we had the COVID challenges on top so it really felt like an opportunity to be able to think and and say that Actually, for any work that we do, we do need to think about the what's next, even if we're still discovering the first steps in the journey in order to be able to make real commitments. And, and often, in, especially in funding conversations, we tend to talk about a year or we, you know, it's, it's very short term. So your question to us very much came across as an opportunity for us to to think in ways that we're more creative and to recognize that this is a journey and a set of questions like most complex questions that we're not going to get solved in one year. And therefore we can think about how it might evolve, even if we didn't even know how the first round was gonna play out and therefore couldn't say specifically what next year or the year after we're going to look like. It was that, that invitation was, was wonderful. And I'd just be interested to sort of hear a bit more because you were doing so much work with, with, the, the, with um, Jim Joseph Foundation and Lippman Campbell Foundation for Living Torah, as well as other funders. I'd just be very interested in how was that given every funder takes their own view. Every, as you said, this was not a core central issue that the Crown family was working on every day. What was it like to work with other funders and to achieve consensus in the kind of work you might do. Yeah, and I, would, I wouldn't answer that in the past tense. We're still working together and still trying to figure this out. But I think you, you hit on a core piece here. Like we, as much as, the, as much as the Crown family and me and my work is the, as domestic Jewish giving team want to have a stake and do good work here, it's not, it's not the biggest piece of our portfolio. So it's also how can we make really, um, really, thoughtful grant making that impacts within our strategy, that impacts our grantees, that works within the framework. And so that's where you get to funders that come together with different portfolios, with different values, with different stakeholders. And, and that, that helps. We can do more if we're all funding, maybe we're all funding for a different reason. Maybe we're all most excited about a different part of the project. And that's what I would encourage funders on this call to think, um, is that the more we talk and the more we work together and co-collaborate and co-fund on projects like this, the more you're given the opportunity to think a little bit outside the box that you would normally get to fund and get to really work and push the boundaries and learn from what could be possible. So I really value um, the partnership that we've created. Um, Prisma was not the only organization that we funded with DEI. There were organizations that 
Crown participated in DI funding for ones that we didn't, and we're still keeping an eye on how they're doing and what they're learning from this time, because it's a new area. It's a new emerging area of funding. And I think that we can all benefit from the information shared. And I'll add one more thing that I think um, from a grantee perspective, I would hope is helpful is that we have tried to make a very clear statement that we don't each need to have our own check-in calls with Paul and Hannah, but rather together. And I think um, as funders, we can also think about the burden that we are placing and the work that we are placing on our grantees, especially during COVID, especially as this was only one project and only one hurdle that uh, Prisma was working on, that they could streamline their stewardship and their grantee updates because we were all working together and we were on the same page. And so I think more of that allows the time for more creativity and the actual work and content to be done if less individual reports need to be made. So I'm glad that we were able to do that as well. Thank you for that. And thanks to your colleagues at uh, Jim Joseph and Lippman Camper. And we're now going to move into the next phase of the conversation. Erica, really thank you. Just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat or share them with Tamar or Hana. Now going to hand over to Deborah schaefer seaman and to Sirida Turk, who's going to continue the conversation about the programming. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I will kick off this part of the conversation, uh, maybe with a little bit of background about the goals of Prisma's race and school culture work. And then Sirda, uh, I will invite you into conversation about uh, your particular school's interest in this work. And uh, maybe we'll get into a conversation about why you jumped in and, uh, and, and what it looks like in action. So when Prisma um, launched this program, we launched with three different uh, target populations in mind for our goals in the program. So our three main sets of goals came around the field of Jewish day schools all around North America, um, the individual schools, and the Prisma team ourselves uh, in order to really honor the work that's been going on for many years, the work in, in schools in ensuring that Jewish day schools and yeshivas are communities of belonging has been going on for many years. Um, Prisma's uh, work in this area too has been going on for a number of years. This is our first deep dive into the work. So as we um, looked at the goals for the Prisma team ourselves, um, we, take the, the approach that we always start with ourselves. We always look inside, assess, shift, deepen, educate ourselves and, and our team um, throughout the process of doing the work alongside the funders and alongside the field. When um, we were thinking about goals for the field writ large, that looking at, um, sort of from the 60,000 foot view of the, the field of Jewish day schools and yeshivas, we were, um, as Paul alluded to, Prisma's in a unique position to be able to offer not just support to individual schools, but to make connections between and among the schools to help with educational resource sharing and really meeting the educational needs of the field around what was, I'm gonna say a year to six months ago, a very time sensitive subject um, for our school leaders. So we uh, walked in with the goal of offering a Jewish approach to race and racial equity work um, with an eye towards schools in particular and raising the profile of the conversation about race within these schools. Um, we also set a very intentional goal of beginning to gather the necessary data and resources in order to support the schools in doing work. So that's uh, our goals for the Prisma team and our goals for the field as a whole. Then for the individual schools, um, Paul mentioned earlier that 
each of these schools is doing their work on their time frame with their context, within their context. And um, that's deeply important to Prisma within this. So we're truly meeting each school at their own level um, and helping them make progress on their own journey. We're not launching in from a um, place of politics, we're stepping in from a place of support since the schools came to us and asked for that support, here we are um, ready to provide the, the resources that will help the schools get there. And that's by uh, building their capacity school by school, offering them the expertise that they're looking for, um, and um, really empowering the school leaders to, to think about these issues within their own context without trying to get it right all the time just being in it and being willing to get messy in the work um, really turned out to be quite a um, holy, uh, if you will, part of uh, the process. Um, and I'll, I'll add one unexpected outcome from all of this is that I have had dozens of Jewish organizations reach out really to learn about our work and grow their own um, capacity in this work. So for, for us at Prisma, that's been phenomenal to have other peers in the field looking to dig deep and ask us questions which enable us to reflect on our own practices. Um, on a really technical level, uh, in this deep dive that we launched, we launched a cohort of 39 schools. Um, they uh, examine their school cultures, they challenge their own assumptions, they learn from experts, and they really committed to uh, furthering the work. Um, we, beyond uh, that cohort of 39 schools, have invested in um, knowledge sharing um, and in resource curation so that schools beyond uh, those 39, that, that initial cohort, will be able to um, also uh, move along this journey together with us. So, um, Sirita, maybe you'll jump in here and talk a little bit um, about the conversation that happened at your school. Why did they decide to participate and, and what is that exploration of uh, the intersection of race and day school culture look like for your folks? Thank you, Deborah. Um, we really felt that push that Paul mentioned from our students and our alumni to respond in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and the protest movement that grew up from that. Um, our students were really looking to connect the past to the present to get some sense of context, a deeper context to those events. And they wanted access to um, the opportunity to explore lived experiences and the details of history as they connect to literally today. So our teachers just galvanized and we pulled together at the end of May, beginning of June, right as exams were happening. And we formed organically this committee that we named our Ari Voot Committee. Ari Voot, focusing on the Jewish value of responsibility. And our head of school who was here, Sarah Shulkin, thank you for being here, um, focused on that concept of not just responsibility to ourselves, but this inter interactive responsibility to our community, both close and at large. And so we wanted to be able to give our entire community, students, parents, faculty, staff, some spaces for reflection where they could process the emotions of that particular moment at the beginning of the summer. We wanted to give them spaces for education where they could learn and think critically about these issues. And we also wanted to give them some spaces for activation. Those who decided that they were in a place where they wanted to create some type of change. So being aware and again, meeting them, meeting our community where they were at was important to us. We had success with this. But it was so quick, it was so sudden, we were limited by time, by reactivity, and by the fact that we knew that this was just the start of a much longer term conversation. And so that was why, in part, we turned to Prisma. Um, we also knew that there were questions, uncertainty, 
discomfort for many in our Jewish day school community and in Jewish day schools at, at large about this topic. So we needed a resource that would provide us with approaches that could be both sustainable and meaningful. And we also wanted a space where we could have a network of partners. We knew that JDSs are going through this process of balancing the conversation, right? The value of seeking justice with the, the, and, and truth about race with the discomfort with talking about race. And so we wanted that long-term partner and a network of other schools and people who were at various spaces in the process so that we could support each other, give feedback about successes and challenges and move forward in this holy work. And that's why we turn to you. So Siri, um, maybe you can dig in a little bit more to how you guys have worked with the diverse opinions of the community that you referenced, right? So, so it's truly an educational journey. Um, it is. Um, and in working with our community, we have tried to be responsive to needs, but also to communicate proactively uh, what we're doing. We've also tried to be thoughtful about inviting the entire community to participate. So our RA VOOT work at the end of the school year last year was continued as we moved into um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day this year, and we we renewed that initiative to do more education, to give spaces for activation and to give spaces for reflection. Having that contact with community, being open about the what we're doing, the why we're doing and the how of it and inviting um, parents, stakeholders, board members into our spaces of learning. That was really important for us in terms of moving conversation forward and keeping everyone on the same page. I love that uh, that you just referenced that that level of transparency um, and the uh, and also the discomfort along the way. Maybe I'll uh, invite Erica um, back into the conversation, you know, along the lines of this transparency and uh, and discomfort, so we can talk a little bit about our our ongoing learning and how we're really learning alongside one another in the work. Um, Erica, you wanna jump in? Sure, so it was really important for the funders that there was a way that we would um, evaluate the program and more importantly, support the grantees. So we are looking um, at creating a peer learning community with um, not only a Prisma staff, but other, representatives from other grantees that are just starting to launch these deeper DEI programs. And they're not all education-based, they're not all even youth-based, but just this idea of giving an open and comfortable place to share challenges, to share opportunities, and to have a place to learn together. So that is in the process of being formed right now. It is being created um, for and with grantees. So again, nothing that um, is being funder pushed, but really being driven as a whole, as a team. And we're looking forward to that, um, really helping us learn from, from each other and continue the learning journey. Yeah, I, one of the things that I love about um, being on the grantee side of this is being in partnership with with other grantees and really being able to talk this through and, and learning together um, with, with the funders. Um, you know, often we wait until we have uh, an answer before we roll out the plan. Um, and in this case, in um, around this topic, if there had been an answer, the world would look very different than it does today, right? So we um, together with the funders, I think, made a commitment to the process and, and then we're learning in partnership. Um, and Prisma's never claimed to be the or a content area expert in this, uh, in, around this topic. We partner with people and, and bring in the content area experts for our schools. Um, and, you know, it, it goes back to our tradition, ethics to the fathers, Rabbi Tarfon is the one who taught us, lo alecham lecha ligmo, 
ולא אתה בן חורין להיבטל ממנה, right? It's not your duty to complete the work, it's not up to you to finish it, but you're not free to desist from it either. So for me, this, this partnership with the funders to, um, to jump in feels quite um, powerful and, and beautiful. Um, maybe I'll um, mention Prisma's next set of, um, you know, next phase of the work. Um, and Erica has, uh, and all of the funders have helped us to think this through um, in, in partnership. So we'll, we'll continue to support this initial cohort of schools. And in addition, I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll create access to the knowledge that we're curating and acquiring with schools beyond that initial cohort um, and continue to deepen uh, the Prisma team's ongoing learning and, and internal work. In addition to that, Prisma will be hiring a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional. Um, and of course, since DEI means so much more than um, race and, and race and school culture, we have existing work that's already underway on, on gender as one example um, in partnership with the Foundation for Jewish Camp and Take Due Respect and Equity. But we're, we're looking um, this work has been emergent for us. I think that's something that is important to share um, and having funders who are partners with us in understanding the messiness and the emergent nature of the work has been uh, has been a true gift. Um, Erica, you wanna jump in? I could jump in on how we're thinking beyond this. So I, I talked about our next steps here. We're looking to continue to support this work, but we're really thinking about how this isn't just a one-time play and how do we integrate this thought? And that is definitely an emergent learning as Deborah said. So for example, um, the conversation around DEI is in, in almost all, if not all of my grantee conversations now, not as a, what are you doing? And if you're not, we're not funding it and not a, what do you want to do? And we'll definitely fund it just to, out of curiosity. How is your organization thinking about this both internally or with your beneficiaries? How are you thinking about this issue and how are you integrating it to your program? Just really out of curiosity and just so that we're aware of the scope. Um, there continues to be funder conversations with a much larger group of funders who are interested in what is going on. And that group is so valuable. Um, and we just learn so much with each other. And then I would say that we talk about it as a larger, as a larger team here at Crown. You know, how do we think about this work? This, this Prisma grant will now just be a conversation that we have with Prisma every year as we're thinking about their funding. It's not that this grant is over, it's just a part of your program. It's a part of the work that we are interested in and that we support um, and that we learn from. And so I think we will, we will help to integrate this work into all of our grantee conversations, not to necessarily grow a portfolio of DEI grants that sit over here by themselves, but that it is a necessary conversation that we hope, you know, really, um, Pulls the, pulls the thread of DI and their values through the work that Crown supports. And so, and I, it's easier said than done. Um, we are learning as we go, but that's our intention is not to create a new, a new funding area, but to um, support this work in the Jewish community as a necessary way to have a vibrant Jewish community that we all are wishing for. Okay, so Erica, for all the funders on the call, what are some lessons learned from your perspective, right, in this work in particular that, that they may be able to learn from? I would say like, don't be afraid to ask questions that you don't know the answer to. It doesn't mean that you're unexperienced. It means we're all in this together. That goes to grantees. We often feel like the funders should know everything. It's not true. Or, um, or to other funders, you know, like, have you talked to this, this organization? Have you seen this proposal? So just to talk and not be afraid to ask questions. Um, the same with, with pushing back on the proposal. You know, we, we pushed back um, for Prisma to think bigger and to think better. And it ended up being 
um, being such a nice partnership. And I think had we thought, oh no, like they're so busy, let's just do it's less money. Um, we never would have gotten here. Um, and I would say the other thing is to, there is a, because we are also new to this conversation, I think there is a fear of messing up and a fear of saying the wrong thing and a fear of putting your foot in your mouth and a fear of funding something that isn't successful. And I think if we wait until everything is proven successful before funding pilots, we won't have anything to fund um, just by virtue of the emerging conversation that we're having. And so I think being willing to try things and, and continuing to learn is, is probably the number one takeaway. Thanks, Erica. Thank you, Sirida. I'm gonna pass back to Paul so we can uh, jump into conversation with the crowd. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Sirida. Thank you, Erica. Um, and really appreciate you being here. Really, this is now an opportunity for questions and for conversation. I know that um, many of you on this call have been engaged in this work in different places. We would love to hear from you. Um, actually, I think we, while other people, if you want to ask a question, put it in the chat or raise your, either physically raise your hand or raise your hand in uh, using the Zoom thing, it would be great to hear your questions. Just, I want to ask one question of one or two of our participants, because we're not alone in doing this work. That's one of the things that we really appreciate, even in the school's environment. And uh, UJ Federation of New York and the Jewish Education Project in this last year have also been working um, and we've been building our collaboration. I just lost Javi off the video. Uh, Javi Khan, our colleague from UJ Federation, are you, you're still there, thank you. In yet another beautiful setting as you always are on these calls. Um, Javi, would you like to spend a moment on, uh, on the work you've been, and anything you want to add to the learning that our panelists have been sharing? Sure, first of all, I want to thank um, everyone on this call for jumping into this space and thank you thank you to prisma thank you paul thank you deborah it's really been and to crown and to jim joseph and to lip and camper i think this, this has been quite a year um and the messiness and the emergent nature of the work um is really reflective in in all the in what the grantees are doing and what the funders are doing what i thought i would add is the power of the cohort model juxtaposed with the uh, slight, a slightly different approach that, that we took this year is we had a two track process. We took a cohort of four schools and we interspersed individualized consulting uh, sessions in between the multiple cohort sessions. And what we found is that it, the power of sharing challenges and successes, but frankly, mostly challenges of the work was really compelling because what we saw is that schools tend to feel that this item, whether it's with a certain group of stakeholders or with a parent or with the board member, you know, is unique to them. And really this sort of change work is difficult. It takes time as was all already said here and most schools or the schools in this cohort are facing it. However, that is just, that's not to say, the last thing I'll say is that every school as has been said here is at a different point in the journey. And even the schools that are furthest along on this journey still feel that there's much work to do. And I'm proud to be working with Deborah to collaborate, to try to support schools along this journey and to be in this for the long haul. Finally, the question that I have is how do we engage the widest spectrum of schools in this work? without getting political without, but how do we, how do we get more schools involved in this work? That's my question that I'd love to hear the answer to. Thank you, Javier. I'll open that up to any of our panelists, Deborah. Um, I, I'll launch in and say, uh, by inviting them. Really and truly what I found is that when I picked up the phone and I called and I said, we're here to support you wherever you are in this process. And we have phenomenal funders who are putting money on the table that can support you as your own school and in partnership with other schools. Everyone said yes. Um, like this was 
no matter their politics, no matter their religious flavor, no matter their geography, we have schools literally from all around North America um, and all across the, the Jewish religious spectrum. Um, so that's, that's been my experience of it. I will say that Prisma has deep relationships with these pre-existing deep relationships with these school leaders, and that certainly helps. Right, so um, I would say coupled with the invitation, this work is, is relational work, right? This work is about getting to know other human beings. Um, so we have um, um, stepped into the, the space of that relational engagement and, and made these invitations that way. And that's how we have found um, success in the area. And I would say that the last um, learning is, to tell them they don't have to get it right, right? Like schools get, have to get things right a lot of the time, right? There's a lot at stake. And to be able to say, this is, there is a lot at stake here and we don't have to get it right. And Prisma will provide you with the social media kit and the press kit and how to talk to your parents about this and how to talk to your board about this and how to do education with your faculty about this, right? So that we're all speaking a language of, dare I say, imperfection, right? Or, or, or we're all in this together. Um, I think that's been, those, those three aspects have really been helpful for us in engaging a, a wide range of schools. Thank you. I just, just wanna also say that we collaborated with the Jewish Education Project uh, to create this program and it's been terrific to have their expertise and guidance every step of the way. Thank you. Javi, and I also want to acknowledge Martin Fleischmann, who's the president of the Jewish Education Project. She's traveling today and so not able to speak, but Martin, it's great that you're here. Let me turn next to Deborah Feldstein. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk about the specific outcomes you're hoping to achieve and how those are being measured um, by the investment that's being made in this work. I'm not sure who can best answer that. Deborah, do you want to talk about that at the network level? And Siri, maybe you could think about what outcomes you're looking at from a school point of view. Sure. Um, and I, I'm also interested in, in Erica's perspective on this in terms of, uh, of outcomes. I think that'll be helpful for everyone. So um, Deborah, the, the answer to um, the question, uh, uh, unsurprisingly, there are lots of answers to that question. Um, each school is setting their own individual goals that they are working on with their own individual consultants. I couldn't agree more with Javi's comment that um, working with a consultant parallel to the cohort model uh, is essential. And in fact, Sirida was a participant in our program and we fell in love with her and then immediately hired her as a consultant for other schools. Um, so you can, and that consulting for her will be starting in the fall. Um, so that's uh, one way that uh, we're identifying the goals is to say to the schools, what are your needs? You as a team self-identify and then the consultants are helping to track them um, in, a, in a transparent system that we set up. Um, um, I think that the second set of goals are for our own Prisma internal team. Um, and we've set out uh, intentional and, and articulated goals for our team, um, partly about our hiring uh, practices, partly about who we put um, on speaking engagements, who we hire as coaches, who we bring in, right? Are we, um, when we're looking to place heads of school, are we tapping into communities of Jews of color um, in order to make sure that we are uh, reaching far. Um, I think those are sort of two parallel uh, sets of goals. There, there are many more, but maybe I'll start with those. Sarah, do you want to jump into Milken? I also see long-term and short-term goals in terms of you know my school as an institution. The bigger overarching, um, I guess, deepest goal is that our students feel prepared and comfortable with having these conversations in a community that's broader than their JDS community, um, that they feel um, 
comfortable and that they can have productive conversations and can do so in empathetic ways coming from with the wisdom of different perspectives. So that's that bigger overarching goal. At a, a smaller level, we are looking at you know, what does our school community look like? Does it reflect the greater Los Angeles community? We are looking at our, you know, our practices, hiring, et cetera. We're also looking at what does the school community look like in terms of um, clubs, political clubs, opportunities for discussion and debate, those safe spaces where our community feel, truly feels like a welcoming one for all members of the Jewish community, regardless of um, their level of, of uh, kashrut or their particular you know, skin color. So that's, those are the sort of the, the different levels that we're looking at too, in terms of our specific goals for Milken. Thank you, Erica. I, I, yeah, I'm, interested only, also not to, yeah, go ahead. I'm only gonna add like 30 seconds so we can get to another question. But one of the things that the funders are looking at is I think I mentioned that there's other organizations that a group of funders um, in different ways, we didn't all fund them all, has come together around the same time frame. There's about six or seven organizations that are similar. And we are looking at hiring a consultant to do an evaluation across them not about necessarily the outcomes of the schools, but about these programs and designing DEI programs for an organization. And what does that look like? Multi-year, who's involved, staff or board, um, you know, what's baked in, what are the most successful outcomes to track, you know, those type of things. And so that's sort of a, a step up, but that's necessarily for our learning. Like how do we look and vet and decide on DI programs moving forward? Um, and that's, I think, on funders to, to look at and, and learn from. So that type of evaluation piece, if it happens um, in the next few months or over the next year, we'll look at organizations around this time frame who built following last summer's um, uh, current events and what, what we can learn from those programs that really hit the ground running. Thank you all. Let's turn now to Rabbi Yaffa Chase. Thank you. So I'm wondering how we're all engaging parents. Um, I am a parent in a multiracial family. My son goes to a fabulous uh, Jewish day school, which I think is part of your you know, Christmas program. Um, and I'm a great resource, um, but I haven't been asked to be a resource. And so I think just as Deborah was saying earlier about the importance of asking people uh, to be involved, um, I would love to. And so I'm just curious to know your, your thoughts. In terms of engaging our parent community, um, yeah. we really engage, um, it's been more at I would say the individual teacher level in terms of humanities classes or history classes, we're just moving into a phase where we are this year um, reaching out to community. But we've also had a lot of parents who have reached out to us because of their experience within the community. So we do have parents who are in families of mixed race or families of mixed um, religious uh, interfaith families and so or uh, different sexual orientation gender orientation so those families have been some of the ones who have spoken to us actually and said we want to make sure that our kids are feeling comfortable and feeling that this is not just a place of being but a place of including um, so there's been a lot of coming to us, uh, but that, you know, plants the seed in mind of our next steps for being working in concert and in partnership with our community and reaching out. Yeah, and I was want to add, you know, one of the things that we've always known about our schools is, of course, how central community is to their being, and of course, that's been even stronger during the COVID. Period, and I just wanted to share one example I saw, I saw from the school where they they had one of their regular informal days of teaching with the students, which on this occasion, because of the way we're now, and this was a school that was in person, but they decided to open it up using their live stream in order that not just students who weren't there in person, but also families could listen in. And they did two things. One was they had uh, one of the students who is African-American, who's a senior. She's been in the school her entire career, but she spoke. And actually, for many of her fellow students, they loved it because, because they haven't had a space 
where they could have a good conversation with her as an African-American in the school. And the second was they had um, uh, someone who is a parent in the school who actually happens to be the daughter of one of the longstanding teachers in the school, who's an alum of that school and, and is part of a mixed race couple with, uh, and you know, they talked about their experiences as well. So it's very possible in a safe way and in a way that not just touches the students, but also touches faculty and also the families, the wider community to do those kinds of things. And if anyone's interested in that kind of programming, very happy to, to make connections with that and many other things. And of course, we're learning as schools try different things as part of their activities. Um, let me take one, one more uh, uh, question from the chat and then uh, we're approaching the hour. So that would probably be the final question. Can you speak about changes, if any, to the curricula at schools? Has there been any controversy around creating a more equitable look at history or humanities courses and how are you handling it? Thank you, Zivia, for, uh, for that question. Yes, I'm happy to jump in to speak to that. Um, we are pretty fortunate at Milken to have in our middle school a humanities program, uh, which truly combines the teaching of history with the teaching of literature. So I'm thinking of um, issues like uh, controversial texts, To Kill a Mockingbird, Tom Sawyer, those types of texts uh, we, we haven't shied away from because we teach the history in concert with the actual text. So context is incredibly important. And that's something that we are finding um, makes a huge difference in terms of how curricula is received uh, by both students and parents. Um, we have also, this has been part of my task as part of our RIV committee, started to take a look at our curriculum from the sixth grade level all the way to to the 12th grade level to see in terms of history, you know, are we touching on all voices, all perspectives? Are we creating a complete view of history? Uh, and that's really how we teach this. We teach history, we teach um, identity awareness, and we teach perspective taking and empathy. That's, that's the goal. So we, We've addressed any controversy by trying to be as transparent as possible, number one, by teaching literature in concert with history, number two, by making sure that all voices are represented, number three, and by um, looking at the overarching arc to make sure that it's all age and developmentally appropriate for students. Thank you. Deborah, do you want to say anything else on curriculum? And I'm going to turn to Erica just on a related question. Sure, uh, we are seeing all across the board um, that schools are definitely um, assessing their curricula and their curricular scope. Um, and one of the interesting ways that they are, um, I, dare I say, low hanging fruit or one of the easier ways uh, that schools are finding to um, broaden uh, their curricula or adjust it are through their libraries through their classroom libraries and, uh, and their school libraries. And we had a number of librarians participate in the program who went home and did a whole lot of um, adjusting their collections. Um, and we found that when you can see people in the books in front of you, they uh, become people with whom you have conversations. Um, and, uh, and um, we are uh, deeply grateful to the schools for jumping into the curricular work, and, and that's one of many ways that they're investing in this. Thank you, Erica. I wanted to come to you last with a related question, which is um, controversy is unfortunately close to us on many things that we do, not just this subject, but many others. What advice would you give to other funders when thinking about the potential controversial issues grappling with this or anything else that you work on in the education space? Um, I would just say to be honest and open. So the worst thing an organization can do is, is sugarcoat or lie to the funder because they think that's what the funder wants, wants to hear or because they think that they won't get renewed for funding or that the funder won't believe in them. It's um, I, I think it's when a, when a grantee comes to us with an honest approach to this is what we are struggling with, this is how we've thought about it, this is who we've talked to, 
this is one idea of a plan. What do you think? Um, that, that shows me that they're thinking critically, that they're thinking thoughtfully. Um, and so I would just say um, for funders to ask the hard questions and to believe in the organization's um, openness and that, again, it's all about relationships. And I think it's a, it's a two-way street and we're all, we're all in this together. Thank you so much. We're almost at the hour. So in a moment, I'm going to hand back to Tamar. I just wanted to say very heartfelt thank you to Erica Phillips, to Deborah Schaefer Seaman, to Sarah de Turk uh, for leading such a rich discussion today. Also, my thanks to the Jim Joseph Foundation and Littman Camphor Foundation for Living Torah, who have been partners with Crown Family Philanthropies in the work. Um, and two final thank yous, one to Tamar Friedman and to Hannah Olson, uh, my colleague who have worked so hard on making this and other webinars that we do such a success. Thank you to you both. And finally, a thank you to everyone for being part of this. Tamar, let me hand back to you for closing. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I wanna echo all of your things. Um, this was a wonderful, robust conversation and I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to come together and, and have this conversation and really start this conversation because I know it's always a to be continued um, with, most, with most subject and especially this subject. So thank you for, thank you to all the presenters for being here and sharing um, and learning with us. And thank you to everybody that logged on to be part of this conversation. Um, and here at JFN, we're committed to, to bringing, more, um, bringing more of this to you to creating places and spaces to have these conversations about this and many other things. So please um, keep joining us, keep reaching out to, to myself and my colleagues with ideas for other programs that, that, um, and topics that you wanna dive into. And we are committed to, to being that platform for all of you. So thank you again and have a, have a wonderful day and, and enjoy your summer. I know, especially when you think about schools right now is the start of, of the summer break. So I hope everybody has a, um, a nice and rejuvenating um, summer and speak to you all soon. Have a great day. Thank you.